from the Pacific coast of Canada. I'm Pedro Mora with Pacific Media and now Pauline. Representative democracy is increasingly delegating authority to a few cabinet ministers who appoint financial managers from the banking sector to efficiently invest our pension funds and the world markets. The problem is that direct democracy and human rights are not in the agenda of market capitalism. Let me explain what I mean. Our mandate is to assist the CPP by earning a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. Fifteen years ago, our federal and provincial governments came together to make some tough decisions. This was to ensure that Canada would be prepared for demographic changes that would result in an increased proportion of retirees receiving benefits versus workers making contributions. The CPPIB was established as a result of those reforms. Designed as an independent investment management organization whose sole purpose is to invest the assets of the Canada Pension Plan not required to pay current benefits. Well, I'm a social activist in Victoria and I act locally and globally and through the Barnard Boker Centre Foundation, which I and some other people founded about 15 years ago, and also through many local solidarity and social justice organizations. I work through those in Victoria and a number internationally. So we work for peace and social justice everywhere. Okay, so you brought a paper to the um, uh, CPP annual, or it's not the annual general meeting, but to a public meeting here in Victoria. And can you tell us just a little bit of what the paper consists of? Well, the Canada Pension Plan, which is mandatory for all Canadians when they are working to contribute to, and when they retire, they receive the Canada Pension, invests our pension money in public, private companies, infrastructure, and owns assets. And it is the mandate by Parliament of the CPP Investment Board to invest where they can get the greatest profit. That is their mandate, that, period. That, that's what he said. The, no, no, it's, it's in yeah, the Act. It's in an the, Act of Parliament with the federal government and nine provinces. So what's the problem with it? The problem is that there are other considerations when one invests money, and particularly when my money is invested and I'm receiving the benefit of it uh, when I stop working, and that is that many of these investments appear to many citizens of Canada as unethical, and inappropriate. They are investments in war, they are investments in corporations that act uh, in illegally occupied countries, they are investments in mining companies in Latin America, Africa, Asia, that act with um, cruelty and uh, cause social and environmental degradation in the communities in which they operate. In fact, many people are killed where mining companies are operating. The mandate formulated for CPPIB at the time of its creation is clear and singular. To maximize investment returns without excessive risk. We are not permitted to do anything that is inconsistent with this mandate. My job as the CEO of CPP Investment Board is to lead a team to make investment decisions that will help to sustain the CPP for future generations. I'm very pleased to report that during fiscal 2012, the CPP fund increased by $13.4 billion. Nearly $10 billion of that increase was from the net investment income generated by our many investment programs across CPPIB. And this represents a 6.6% rate of return for the fiscal year. So specifically, you mentioned here about the military investments. And you said that uh, because of NAFTA, they are exempt from receiving uh, funding receive, from the government? Not receiving. not receiving. Under the North America Free Trade Agreement and certain provisions in the World Trade Organization, 
Governments can give subsidies, loans, and grants to military companies. They are exempt from the rule that says that governments not, may not provide unfair subsidies to local companies. Military companies are exempt from that. So the government of Canada gives a great deal of our tax money to military companies as grants, loans, aids, and also the government of Canada funds an organization which helps Canadian military companies to market their products. What is the name of that organization? Well, it, fall, it, it falls under the Department of Trade and Commerce. Okay. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, it's one of the ways in which Canada uh, invests our, our, our tax money in, and invests it very generously in, in armament companies. So I think I told you specifically that um, there, there's a particular company called CAE in Montreal which 90% of its 1.4 billion annual revenues are exports to many countries with very dubious human rights record. Then you also <laughs> include uh, nuclear weapons? Yes, uh, there are a number of companies and I list them in the brief and I wanted to say that this brief will be posted on the Barnard Booker Center Foundation website mm -hmm. which is Uh, bbcf.ca and it will be posted within a week mm -hmm. and some of the companies that Canada invests in are foreign companies because the CPP investment board does not invest all its money in Canada it only invests 40% of its funds in Canada and they invest in the world's largest armament company which is Lougheed Martin mm -hmm. they invest in Northrop Grumman and Boeing and General Dynamics all those companies are from the USA mm -hmm. and BAA Systems and Rolls-Royce of the United Kingdom are also arms companies and they are also nuclear weapons companies so they produce both so although Canada has always said it's a non-nuclear country our pension funds are being invested in nuclear weapons and manufacturing nuclear weapons uh, well uh, again as CPPIB is what I would call a universal investor we uh, we uh, truly do invest in uh, in all sectors uh, and all geographies, as I pointed out uh, earlier, uh, uh, around the world. Um, and one thing that we explicitly do not do, um, I referred to our policy on responsible investing earlier. Our policy on responsible investing uh, makes it very clear that we do not screen out or eliminate uh, any particular sectors from our investing activity because of the nature of those sectors. Um, Linda, I guess uh, the question referred specifically to uh, armaments as, as one of those, uh, those sectors. And uh, I think that goes back to, uh, very clearly goes back to the mandate that we were uh, given, explicitly given as an investment organization at the time of our creation uh, in the late 1990s. And, and Bob, you, uh, uh, you talked about this in, in your comments as well, that we have a, a very singular and clear investment mandate uh, that is to uh, achieve a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. And at the time that that mandate was created, um, the reformers of the Canada Pension Plan have very uh, clearly and explicitly deliberated uh, whether there should be other dimensions over and above that investment only aspect to our mandate. They did explicitly consider things like having a requirement to invest regionally across uh, Canada. And uh, as another consideration, they did explicitly consider whether we should have a socially responsible investing dimension to our mandate. Uh, and in both those instances and in all the other uh, potential additions to the mandate that they considered, they intentionally decided that we would uh, not be asked to take those kinds of considerations into account in making investment decisions. So that's why we, we say our very explicit and intentional mandate is singular investment orientation only. You also mentioned uh, companies that trade with Israel. Uh, what's the problem with companies trading with Israel? Well, Israel is illegally occupying the West Bank of Palestine. It also has invaded and essentially created a 
outdoor concentration camp in the part of Palestine, which is Gaza, where it's extremely difficult to get in or out of. And they conduct regular military invasions of Gaza. And as you know, there was a major military invasion of the Gaza several years ago. In and in these invasions and in their constant incursions into the lives of the people in the West Bank, uh, Israel imprisons children. It detains people for many years without trial, and their trials are also not fair trials. Uh, they harass and threaten civilians, unarmed civilians, constantly. And as I say, sometimes kill them and sometimes wound them. And as we know, uh, they invade, they try to prevent any entry into Gaza by sea, and they invaded a Turkish ship on the high seas, which is an act of piracy, and in doing so, killed nine people and injured many others and imprisoned them and trashed the ship, which was a Turkish ship. Uh, it came to our attention during the hearing of the CPP in the public meeting that we, you and I attended in Victoria. And while we were there, Kevin Nish brought to the attention of the meeting and to the CPP that he was injured and attacked while he was on the Mavi Marmara by fighter helicopters that were using equipment built by CAE of Montreal, in which the CPP Investment Board invests very heavily. Well, the first thing I would say in, in response to Kevin is that this kind of tragedy uh, impacts us all on, on many different levels. And to, to, uh, to say, well, that's none of our concern is, of course, a wrong answer because it's the concern of all of us. It is a public policy issue. And, you know, one can trace the chain of events to many, many different things. In the particular case of the company that Kevin is referring to, that activity is viewed by society in Canada and in elsewhere as a legitimate uh, activity of creating uh, systems, weapons, and uh, it is viewed and regulated accordingly. As David has, has said in response to some uh, earlier questions, we do not screen out investments. We take into account these environmental, social, and governance factors. We engage with companies, uh, but we do not screen them. That is, I think, the ultimate right course. But that's not to deny that bad things do happen in the world and that individuals and companies can be involved in them to a, a, a small extent, a peripheral extent, uh, but we, we do not make those kinds of judgments in screening. Another point you bring up is the mining companies. And uh, th there is a, an objection of uh, the CPP. I'd be investing on uh, mining companies. Can you? Expand well, on that, I'd like to talk about the mining companies because Canada is a very big player in global mining. Uh, Canadian mining companies are everywhere from Papua New Guinea to the Congo and they have a very large presence in Central and Latin America. Canadian mining companies do not operate abroad with the same standards with which they are expected to operate in Canada. Uh, both in terms of labor standards, health standards and environmental standards. They operate uh, usually in cahoots with um, corrupt public officials in these countries and very often cause great environmental damage. I, I refer you to particularly to Gold Corp because this is a community uh, in Guatemala around Gold Corp which has had absolutely devastating effects by the open pit gold mine of Gold Corp. There are... Um, my experiences when I went to Mexico to meet with some environmental activists who were opposing Fortuna mines in Mexico. Um, the, one of the activists was killed the night before we were to meet him and his cousin and brother were severely injured. Okay, they were killed accidentally? On, no, they were, no, these were targeted killings and, and they are, there have been in Guatemala targeted killings uh, by known killings by security guards of, of environmental activists. In Papua New Guinea, um, the security guards employed by 
Barrick Gold, which is the world's largest gold company, again, a Canadian company in which the CPP invests very heavily. Um, many people have been killed. There have been gang rapes of village women in the area around Barrick's mine in Papua New Guinea. So Canadian mining companies behave unethically and irresponsibly abroad. There have been efforts to bring in private members' bills in Canada to regulate Canadian corporations abroad. So far, we haven't had any success in having these private members' bills passed. There is another instance of a mining company, which I is a very special case, and I, I would like to bring this to the attention of your viewers because it's not a very well-known example. The Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan, which is the largest potash corporation in the world, behaves in an exemplary and very responsible way in its operations in Canada. Its headquarters are in Saskatoon. However, the Potash Corporation of Canada buys phosphates to blend with the, the potash to make fertilizers. Mm -hmm. They buy phosphates from Western Sahara. Western Sahara is an illegally occupied territory. It was illegally occupied by Morocco in 1975. And under the Geneva Conventions of War, to which Canada subscribes, under rulings of the of International Courts of Justice and the Security Council, there are very specific prohibitions against an occupying power engaging in either commercial or residential actions in an occupied country. That includes uh, settling its own citizens in the country, which Morocco has done in the Western Sahara, and also engaging in resource extraction without the permission of the occupied people. The Western Sahara has a government in exile. It is an officially recognized country. It's the Arab Democratic Republic, Arab Sahrawi Democratic Republic. It's recognized by 80 countries. We would like to have the Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan stop buying phosphates from a company which is owned by the Moroccan government and operates in the Western Sahara. This is a very uh, crucial case of the testing of international law. And we believe that the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is acting illegally when it when it invests in countries which are breaking agreements, international agreements that Canada is party to. That also includes Palestine. Is Canada recognized this uh, Moroccan occupation? Canada does not. Canada has not recognized the company, the country of the. Uh, Arab Sahrawi Democratic Republic, and it trades with Morocco, and it um, is negotiating a free trade agreement with Morocco. Now, a number of countries have negotiated free trade agreements with Morocco, and they have excluded the Western Sahara, because they know this is a special case from the free trade. It remains to be seen whether Canada will do this. So what's the standing of the United Nations in, uh, in this case? Well, the United Nations recognizes the rights of the Sahrawi people, and there have been uh, Security Council Resolution. resolutions on this, as well as General Assembly resolutions on, on the matter of Western Sahara. They have tried to conduct referendums mm -hmm. since the Mor Moroccan government took over mm -hmm. uh, the territory when the Spaniards left in 1975, and there have been no, um, there's been no success. The Moroccans have always stonewalled any attempt to have a referendum, and they now have got so many Moroccan citizens in Western Sahara that if they were allowed to vote, they would outnumber the Sahrawi people. It is separated from Morocco and other uh, neighbors by a wall. It's the largest wall in the world. It's it's a wall about 2,000 kilometers long and it's got about a million landmines in it. Now, as I, as I did uh, also mention, uh, though, earlier, we do consider factors such as uh, uh, environmental, social, and, and governance factors uh, into our investing activities uh, to the extent that they do uh, impact the investment decisions, uh, the uh, risk and, and return from uh, the companies that we uh, invest in. And in many instances, they absolutely do. Uh, 
uh, particularly for a long horizon investor such as us. Um, so in those instances, we do take them into consideration. We do engage with companies, as I, um, as I also mentioned. Uh, do encourage uh, companies both to disclose and manage those risks uh, very, uh, very well. Uh, but we don't, uh, on an a priori basis, use those factors to screen out potential investments. They only take those factors into consideration if it poses, uh, the in particular investment opposes or presents a risk or a loss or of returns. In other words, they only will take those factors into consideration if their profit is, is endangered. And uh, I want to, to assure Canadians too that the board of directors is totally at ease with this policy and is, is very mindful that in every one of these areas where calls for so-called ethical investing are made, that there's always a contrary opinion. And the, the board of directors, mindful of our mandate, as David said, is, is quite uh, comfortable in investing with a singular focus on investment return, having regard for those ESG factors that you, you made, David. So uh, that, I think, is an important question that our, our listeners are asking. So you have a couple of recommendations for the CCP or CPP, and uh, can you tell us uh, one of them? Well, we recommended to the CPP uh, investment board that they take into account uh, both social, mm -hmm. uh, environmental, and governance, which they refer to as ESG, mm -hmm. and take this into account in their investment. And we think that the CPP should have a broader mandate, as the, as the Norwegian C, uh, pension fund does, that it should have an ethical uh, content. We were told that we, this would only happen through an act of parliament. Um, the, they were very blunt about this. They did not agree that the investment board was aiding and abetting the breaking of international agreements to which Canada was party to. And their final words at that meeting and the final words of the vice president in the public meeting was, we do nothing illegal. Mm -hmm. So I think that my, our recommendation is that it's up to citizens' act, act, action, that citizens must become more active and aware and bring more pressure. We need to, to keep after the investment board, but we also have to do perform political action. In other words, our members of parliament and our government and the political parties. And the third thing is that we have to act in terms of all investment funds. Many people, teachers, retired civil servants, also have a pension fund. And they need to be aware and active in when they, where these pension funds are being invested, as well as their own private investment funds. Van City, we had two officials from the Van City Ethical Fund who, who were with us during the private meeting, and they pointed out that ethical investments are actually quite profitable, and that we they also agreed that there was an obligation uh, on public investing to, to invest in, in the world, and that we should invest lawfully as Canadians. Given that they're claiming that their only purpose is to maximize profits, if that is the mandate from Parliament, yes. should we be lobbying Parliament rather than the executive directors of uh, CPP? Both. I, I think that they can be, the, the board and the investment staff of IPP can certainly be directed towards the fact that sustainable and ethical investment does create a profit and that investing in companies, and again we're only talking about the share of, of the CPP that goes into public companies, investing in companies which are not sustainable or ethical is actually a risk because more and more people are understanding that Barrett Gold, that Fortuna, that many Canadian companies, including our armaments companies, are causing instability and uh, murder in some cases, uh, injury, enormous social 
uh, conflict and, and environmental degradation all over the world. And that those investments are really a risk because people are becoming aware of them. They don't want to invest in them themselves and they're going to be bringing attention to those companies as well as to the CPP. So it's a combined thing. I think we have to do political pressure but we ha and we have to pressure the IPP um, the I CPP I investment board, but we also need to be talking about these companies and looking for other ways to divest in them and to bring public attention to the fact that these are neither s sustainable, safe, or ethical investments. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there is a chance that while this uh, conservative government we have is going to listen to you? There's always a chance that somebody will listen to us and and by pressuring parliament we also cre create awareness in citizens and since this is a government which is very much concerned with corporate profit if they think that corporate proper profit is endangered by citizens action they will respond mm -hmm. well Teresa Wolf Wood thank you very much for your time Okay, thank you very much for coming over. Yeah. Our economic system is based on the accumulation of capital. The CPP Investment Board accumulates money very successfully to the tune of about $10 billion a year. Some religious ideologies believe that profits on money are usury and therefore sinful. However, social activists are not too concerned with the religious sinfulness of it, but they are concerned with which businesses deserve to use the CPP funds. They want qualifications based on human rights and ecological concerns. Looking at an old dilemma between fixing a system or replacing it, someone once said, we cannot convert a tiger into a vegetarian. How much longer are we going to continue trying to calibrate the capitalist system so it will work to our advantage? At someone else's expense, of course. And how many times are we going to revive the capitalist market system when it collapses again? A framework for building an alternative political system which will create an economic system independent of money as written in this little booklet Perpetual Direct Democracy published by Amazon.com and you can also see it for free online at pacific.ca I am Pedro Mora